Uh, so hello everybody, my name is Nicolas Stikov. I am a professor at Ecole Polytechnique and a researcher at the Montreal Heart Institute at the University of Montreal. And the title of the talk is Reproducibility on a Platter. I'll start by quoting Thomas Kuhn, who wrote one of the most famous books about the history and philosophy of science, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. And in the context of today's talk, when I talk about scientific revolutions, I'd like you to think, to think about publishing. So Kuhn claims that science and publishing uh, go through five phases. A pre-paradigm phase, that's when you're starting to establish some ways of communicating, but this would be like very old textbooks from you know, the Greek times. Normal science, that's kind of after the invention of the printing press, uh, when people actually were able to send uh, printed papers. A crisis, uh, which I believe we are in now, and I'll try to argue about that, followed by a paradigm shift and the post-revolution phase when things get back to normal. So why do I claim we're in phase three, the crisis? Um, this here is a figure from a couple of years ago that was published in Nature, which is if you take every paper that has been published in the history of academic publishing, you take the first page and you stack them all on top of each other, just the first page, you will reach a mountain that's almost as high as Mount Everest. About 20 million of these papers, so this is that bottom part of the, of the stack, have zero citations. And then another 20 or 25 million have one to 10 citations. So there's a number of papers that nobody's reading and uh, very few people cite them. And then we get to this more respectable territory, but that comprises only a tiny sliver of uh, the academic output. So I think this trend is obvious that it's increasing. There's more and more papers being published. And I also believe that fewer and fewer people read papers or at least read papers carefully. Then we have the problems of reproducibility. You know, the replication crisis is something that was in the news and still is every now and then. So we're all aware that we have a problem with replicating other people's findings, even some landmark studies. We have the problem of rising costs of publishing. So this here is uh, the graph that shows how the costs of subscription to journals is increasing compared to the inflation rate. And I think people in this room are aware that this is a big problem. And then we have this inflation of PhD degrees. Uh, it used to be that a PhD was a pretty secure way to a tenure track position. Not the case anymore. This is in the UK. About 50% of PhDs immediately leave academia and go into industry. And then the other 50 struggle, make it to some kind of temporary academic position, but eventually only 3% make it to tenure track professor. Finally, you have the reviewers. They're tired. They're not properly incentivized and sometimes they have conflicts of interest. Uh, we even made it to some uh, popular media. This is John Oliver and Last Week Tonight with a very nice expose of all of these problems that I've showed you here. If you want to take the time, about 15, 20 minutes, it's actually a very well-researched uh, piece of uh, media. So what is the paradigm shift? According to Kuhn, is uh, the phase in which the underlying assumptions of the field are re-examined and a new paradigm is established. And I will argue that that paradigm shift is open science. Now, open science is many things to many people. There is preprints, there is open access, there is open slash paid peer review, replication studies and or negative results, data and software sharing, publishing, micro-publishing observations, uh, pre-registration, and I know that many of you are in these fields, and I apologize if, ex if I've excluded some of you from this list, uh, but uh, I think you, you get the spirit. You know, there's a lot of things happening in the field of open science. And, and then I want to spend a slide on science communication, because in a way, that whole previous slide is science communication, but recently, people are saying, oh, you know, if you do science communication, you're a journalist, or, you know, you're, you're doing PR, or you're a press release office. Uh, and I will argue that that's not the case through my personal uh, experiences. Uh, I do a lot of science communication. Uh, some of it pretty standard. I'm on the editorial board of Magnetic Resonance in Medicine, which is this very technical journal that most magnetic resonance scientists are publishing in. Uh, I'm a guest editor of a special issue for NeuroImage, another big publisher. One is Wiley, the other is Elsevier. So you would consider that kind of like a regular job for a uh, research uh, uh, for an academic. But then I also uh, run a couple of blogs. Um, this is a blog I founded and recently passed on. It's called uh, The Brain Mapping. It's the blog of the Organization for Human Brain Mapping. This is the blog of the International Society for Magnetic Resonance and Medicine, ISMRM. I'm also coordinating a network in the Balkan. That's where I'm originally from. I'm from Macedonia. Uh, and we've organized four, coming up on five conferences, connecting researchers in the region. 
And then I also run this blog here, which is called Magnetic Resonance in Medicine Highlights, which is a bi-weekly series of interviews with uh, authors of papers. And uh, then we publish a magazine. Wiley publishes it for free. We distribute it at our conference. And we take a luminary and we interview them for the cover. And we already have three issues of these. Uh, for the third issue, the person on the cover is Al Makovsky, and he is my academic grandfather. Uh, he's created this very successful lab at Stanford University. It's created many, many successful research uh, projects and many faculty positions. Uh, and there's one thing that I learned in this lab, and that is to appreciate the value of slow science. This is an equation, probably the only you'll ever see in this meeting, so there you go. In magnetic resonance imaging, the signal-to-noise ratio, the amplitude of the signal, the strength of the signal, is proportional to the square root of the time you spend acquiring data. To rephrase, that means to amplify your signal by a factor of two, you need to spend four times as long acquiring data. So I think you see the metaphor here. Sometimes slow science pays off, but you really need to slow things down. Well, I think I have done in my career. Um, I actually graduated with a PhD from Stanford in 2009 having never published a single paper. My first academic paper was published in 2011. This was with the approval of my academic mentor. I was still productive. I had a lot of conference abstracts. I just didn't think the time was right for a paper. So what did my research timeline look like? Well, in 2011, I published my first paper. Some of it based on my PhD, some of it based on uh, just some free time I had after I defended my PhD. Then that paper proposed a particular technique, which I validated in 2015 using MRI and histology. I shared the data. And finally, last year, put up this preprint that summarizes the field and shows the way forward. In these six, seven years, the field really blossomed. Uh, it created my career. You know, thanks to this project, I eventually got a tenured position at the University of Montreal. Uh, but what's also very important is that I feel like it really practices what I'm preaching in the sense that here's a pre-registration, here is the actual experiment, here is the data that came out of the experiment, and here's my conclusion kind of wrapping up the field. If you ask me, I would make this one paper with a couple of parts. But, you know, it's not the current climate. I think I've slowed down enough. I don't think I should slow down more than this. Uh, but there is one part in this puzzle that is missing. The data is there. But what did I do to that data to get these findings? And I feel like this is something that is very relevant in today's climate. And uh, that gets down to the issue of reproducibility and replicability. In case you're not aware of the difference, reproducibility is can you recreate the same result using original data and code? So the same data and code from the study. Replicability is can you recreate the same result using new data, but the same experimental design? This talk is about reproducibility. So to reproduce, you need data, code, and an environment. And for example, this is a paper from my field. Again, I don't expect you to know too much about it. But it's basically saying that you know, we have problem reproducing neuroimaging analysis across operating systems. And there's something that can be done about that. So this is a slide made by my student, Aga, uh, who is in the audience. Uh, by the way, we just found out during the power pitches that Aga means an oven, oven that is always on. <laughs> so thank you, Aga. <laughs> he is always on. <laughs> Um, so he created this recipe for reproducible analysis. Um, one, put your code up. GitHub is a good place to put it. Make your data publicly available somewhere. And again, I apologize that not all the data hosting services are listed here. Create an environment in a Docker file that preserves the dependencies. And then create interactive plots and analysis in Jupyter notebooks that can hopefully be shared on the web. Uh, there's beautiful slides at the link below where you can actually click and learn about all of these if you don't already know. Uh, this is something that just went live today. We just tweeted it. And uh, this is also something a little bit more specific, which convinces people that Jupyter notebooks are fun, but they're not enough to create a reproducible analysis because other people may not have the exact same software versions that you installed on your computer. So what do you do? Well, we created a piece of software that I'll tell you a little bit more about that provides you with the tools to create a reproducible quantitative MRI analysis. Now, this is where the Canadian Open Neuroscience Platform comes in. This is a pan-Canadian initiative, $11 million, that uh, has a lot of different goals. It's under the leadership of Alan Evans, who is here in Montreal. 
These are the different committees. So you will see that JB Pauline, who is also the chair of your local organizing committee of Force 11, is leading the technical steering committee. And here I am in charge of the communications of the CONP. And uh, this is the network of partners. And this is a poster where you can learn a little bit more about the CONP, the Canadian Open Neuroscience Platform, and our partnership with the Tannenbaum Open Science Institute, also a Montreal and McGill initiative. And uh, we have Annabelle here to present this poster, number 49. So you see communications, right? But I think by now you've realized that communications is many things. Uh, together with Pierre Balek and Samir Das, we came up with this idea for how to create a two-pronged approach to communication. One being outreach with a lot of international partners, Force 11 being one of them. And the second being publishing using a lot of the tools that you have been discussing today at this conference. Our main deliverable is something that still doesn't have a name, but it's focusing on reproducibility. And our first partner for this reproducibility initiative has a name. It's called Aperture. It's the new publishing platform of the Organization for Human Brain Mapping. So what would this reproducible initiative look like? Let me show you a video, and I will just guide you through it. Uh, the idea is that we can take Jupyter Notebooks and put them live online using Binder. There was a presentation about Binder earlier yesterday, I believe. And you can use Python. That's one option. Jupyter Notebooks work natively with Python. But you can also add a Docker, pile, a Docker file, and you can use MATLAB or Octave or other, other languages. So you get an email. And the email says, the analysis can be found right here. Click on the link. The link will take you to a place where you can first load the data that came into the, into the uh, analysis. So here it is, it's all publicly available. And then what you can do is you can do the analysis and you can produce the figures that came from that analysis. So the code is right there in Binder. And when you run it, you will get an image. That's what I work with, MRIs. And these are MRIs to calculate the amount of myelin you have in your brain. How healthy is your brain? The nice thing is that you can interact with this script and make changes right there in the browser for example, very simply, you can change the slice that you're looking at. So you could be looking not just at one static Im image, but a series of images. And then what you can do is you can also display these results, visualize them using uh, some nice visualization tools. For example, Plotly, that's another Montreal startup. And uh, you can you know, create much more interactive graphs where each of the figures in the plot can be isolated, grouped, analyzed with different statistical tools. So this is just an example, very simple one, but now I'll show you some more complicated ones. For example, here is something called Sprinter, and it's a way to um, deal with figures that are very heavy, that have a lot of data in them. Uh, and these static figures are not an ideal solution for reporting analysis based on volumetric data. So the common data formats would require heavy lifting, but we can lift one of these, a very large data set, and we can create this mosaic of a number of sprites, which just makes a 3D image into very nice uh, uh, 2D visualizations. Now, this is not my work. Uh, this is something that uh, has been generated by colleagues. And uh, this is uh, what you can achieve with these sprites. Feed them into a Jupyter notebook, and then you can interact with them. It's light, it's fast, and you're able to see the entire 3D from three different orientations. Uh, this is another way. Uh, and uh, by the way, uh, BrainSprite is an open source library. And uh, uh, there is no Python version, but it will be soon available in Nylearn. What is Nylearn? It's an open source Python uh, tool for fast and easy statistical learning of neuroimaging data. And it can also produce plotly powered interactive figures. Some of these are right here. And again, they look beautiful. But the nice thing is that you can actually interact with them in the browser. Something a little more static, but equally exciting. This is a study that is uh, uh, by several colleagues, many of them in Montreal, uh, that uses uh, data from Alzheimer's. This is a large data set, except the data is sensitive. So there's a lot of privacy issues. So what the co-authors did, they said, well, we can't use the actual data, but we can create these simulations, and we can show you exactly the analysis we did with simulated data. So please go ahead and use our tools to be able to categorize uh, uh, highly predictive signatures of brain atrophy in Alzheimer's patients. Now, we have a partner in the COCO Foundation. The COCO Foundation is interested in helping us make a publishing platform out of this. And this is a COCO sprint that we did with Adam Hyde. It happened in Montreal a couple of months ago. 
And the first client that wants to use these reproducible notebooks is uh, the Organization for Human Brain Mapping and their publishing platform, Aperture. J.B. Pauline is leading these efforts. And again, it's a busy slide, but it just shows that there is hunger for these kinds of reproducible analysis. And we really hope that this partnership works out. Now, the last five minutes or so, I want to spend on something that is very close to my lab, not to show off. I know not any of you probably care about quantitative magnetic resonance imaging, but to give you a proof of concept of where I would like to take this reproducibility initiative. We developed a piece of software that uh, creates quantitative MR workflows. The team is right here. Uh, several of the people are in the room. So uh, there's Aga, there's Tommy, and uh, I know a couple of them are also following the conference on Twitter. Our idea is to create this umbrella software that will put many different techniques uh, together. Well, we have the tool, right? It's QMR Lab. And we have a Docker or any other kind of code uh, uh, dependency capturing uh, device. Uh, we can create a Dockerized QMR Lab. Uh, if you don't know what this is, just uh, type uh, pen pineapple apple pie in YouTube. It's pretty funny, actually. Uh, so we have uh, high performance computing to enable us to run these uh, Dockerized versions of uh, QMR Lab on the Compute Canada platform. Lots of different things are in QMR Lab. The code base is open source, it's collaborative, it's modular, it's peer reviewed. Uh, lots of different functionality, simulations, fitting, uh, graphical user interface, lots of different quantitative MR methods, but you don't really care about all that. What you, what you should care about is how do you deploy and how do you integrate all of this? And uh, we support different kinds of languages. We support Octave, we support MATLAB, we also support Python. And we use a lot of different standards that uh, many of them are developed in Montreal uh, to execute the analysis uh, using high performance computing on the Compute Canada network. So let me give you an example of what I envision a paper published by this Aperture platform can do. You see here, this reads like a very standard review article. Okay, T1 mapping inversion recovery is just the bread and butter of magnetic resonance physicists. And now we're going to start scrolling. And you will notice that it starts out regular. These are just figures. But then you notice that the figures are actually interactive. So you could see the data right there. And not only that, you can play with different kinds of simulations to see the discrepancies between the actual data and the simulated data. You can show the code that made these figures right there in the HTML. This is using JavaScript. And this code can be copy pasted and executed if you feel that way. But the other thing that you could do is also you can go to Binder. You can click and it will open a whole new window where the analysis is actually performed and you will be able to execute, generate the figures, and modify the figures according to your wishes. So something that starts out as this very clean PDF-like document has a couple of layers, interaction with the figures, visibility of the code, and finally, interactions with the code. Why are we doing this? Well, we want to create workflows. We feel like there is a need to connect the acquisitions to the quality control, to the parsing, the pre-processing, and finally, the fitting. And it's always nice when we can provide provenance, when we can show everybody what went in to create these particular data sets and these papers that come out of these data sets. We also introduced some statistics tools. So we've been publishing some abstracts uh, in uh, magnetic resonance and neuroimaging conferences. And we're also engaging with industry, because I feel like this is also a missing link. Um, I will tell you a brief story about a startup, uh, Hard Vista. It's a Stanford University startup. Again, coming from this culture of slow science, these guys took 10 years to do their PhD. Uh, and uh, now they're uh, integrating with the scanners that produce images. And uh, the way they do it is they bypass the front end of the scanners, which is very proprietary. And they say, OK, we're going to get the images directly from the scanners, and we're going to do some real-time processing on them. Well, we want to latch on to them because they found a way around Siemens and GE and a couple of other big uh, uh, manufacturers. And they're sharing their code with us so we can actually run QMR Lab, the software I told you about, on Hard Vista. We can incorporate it, and then we can fetch data from the scanner, generate, quant generate quantitative maps, and we can use a plugin API that will open the door to, to be used by external software installed on the workstation. So we trigger a QMR workflow, and we get quantitative maps at the scanner site. So, how does this all come together? This is the traditional way of doing science. We're jumping over hurdles. Data acquisition, data curation, analysis, finally, if we're lucky, publishing. What I would like to see is I would like to see 
more of a sprint. Or if you're like me, maybe it's a leisurely stroll, slow science. But we have the front end that can interact with the machinery, with the MRI scanners. We have the workflow triggering software. We have all of these great tools that you are developing. And finally, we are developing a publishing platform that can make this a reality. So what's very important is to create a community. I feel like Montreal is a great place for that. Um, we have a tradition called Open Science Beers. It's been going on for a year. Um, and actually what you can see here is many of the people that come to these every Wednesday at 444. And you will see the prototype for Aperture together with the beer and my computer and JB Pauline sitting right there. So actually we're not just drinking, we're, we're, doing, we're doing good work. Uh, we celebrated one year uh, about a month ago. Uh, Greg, who's in the audience, organized a, a very nice uh, a hackathon. And at that hackathon, we uh, uh, celebrated one year of Open Science Beer. And then I invited some of my students who don't really know about Open Science. I was like, come to Open Science Beer. And they were like, what kind of beer? <laughs> and that's where this came from. It's science beer. And uh, we're opening them weekly. Uh, some of you actually came to Elsa's yesterday. How many were at Elsa's? Perfect. So it was very good to see you all. This keeps going. So every time you're in Montreal, let us know. Wednesday, 444. And I hope you had a good time. So uh, this is uh, all the thanks I have to give. In particular, uh, my students, Aga and Tommy, who are here. Uh, and uh, there is also a um, Twitter account, email address. And this is the name of our lab. The name of our lab is Neuropoly. It's kind of like the game Monopoly. You collect your degree, and then you pass through Start, and you come and work with us. So if anybody's interested, we are actually hiring different kinds of profiles, programmers, communication folks. Uh, I'd be curious to tap into this community. So thank you for your attention. So I guess I'm moderating my questions. So please. Yeah. So what, um, I guess my question has to do with um, what is sort of the equivalent of a library in a future world where this is kind of the mode of, <laughs> of scholarly communication? Is, is there a need, do you imagine scientists just sort of sitting at their, their terminal or computers looking at these things and playing with them? Or do you imagine big clusters of students interacting with things like this where they might need help? Well. I imagine a model where the library can actually spend some resources supporting this kind of stuff. I feel like the libraries are so overextended just paying for the PDFs, they're not even thinking about what they could be doing with that money. Now, I really don't want to go into the business model of the library, but I feel like this is something that needs to be supported from academic institutions and not from for-profit publishers. So what I would like to see is a library dedicating space, computing power, uh, know-how, uh, any kind of support that would make it easy for somebody to come and use this. Because again, it takes some literacy. Uh, so I, you know, I'm really happy to see librarians here that are very technically savvy. I do think that's the future. And maybe, maybe some of this money that is going to the big publisher at the moment can actually come to support some of these initiatives. Hosting, computing power, or even just hiring people to help out with the whole process. Thank you, great talk. Um, you've been talking about computing power and hosting, which kind of leaked my questions. You know, you mentioned that the code is available, you can run it and so on. Where is that hosted, was that computed, and you know, what are the limitations? Because you know, MR data can get pretty quickly. Of course. So, uh, we have, uh, a bit, I could, I could talk, tell you about my lab and maybe a little bit broader than that, but uh, uh, the code that we host is on GitHub. The data is available, so anybody can download a local copy, install it, run the analysis. But if we want to get this on Binder, then you're right. We need to put it some, up somewhere. Data is not so much of a problem. You know, it seems like there's terabytes of data available from many different hosting services. Whether they're permanent, we'll see. But I, I have a good feeling about it. But then the computing infrastructure, this is something where we're really leveraging the Canadian Open Neuroscience Platform. The Canadian Open Neuroscience Platform is giving us access to uh, the C-Brain infrastructure. Uh, Compute Canada is working closely with us on deploying Binder on Compute Canada. And as long as we're small, a lot of the professors have certain quotas that they can use to support this. At some point, if this scales, 
we're hoping that you know there are uh, charges that we can make, hopefully not too big, and maybe maybe convince some government agencies to say, look, you know, this is good. It puts Canada on the map. Maybe we should invest and support this because that is the future, and many countries are really jumping on the open science bandwagon. All right, so 2.25, I am on time again, twice in a row. <laughs> uh, any, any other questions? Um, so you said that you, um, you didn't publish when you got your PhD. How would you advise PhD students who feel that they kind of want to go along that road? I mean, it's really difficult, I think, especially in some disciplines to to yeah, say I'm agreed. not going to do that. Agreed. So, I, first I, I should say, maybe I was lucky. Uh, you know, that, uh, I, I feel like just getting a faculty position is luck in general. Uh, now, of course, publications do increase your chances of getting a faculty job. My first interviews were very awkward because it was like, oh, where are your publications? Uh, now, I, I always wonder how, how much of a downer I should be here, but eh, I'll, here I go. Um, we have too many PhD students, many of them doing the same thing. Um, and the chances of a PhD student continuing with a successful academic career are low. That's just a fact. You look at the numbers. Now, nobody's really explored how much lower is it if you have zero or one versus 10 publications. Uh, yeah, maybe you're doubling your chances, but they're still pretty low. What publishing little allowed me to do is think a lot about the future of science, where I want to take my work, how I want to do it, and to network with the right kind of people. Uh, I really feel like we as faculty are a little selfish. We hire our students and we're like, you're going to publish this many papers because that's what's going to get me the grant. Uh, and I think if faculty encourage their students to be a little bit more creative with their time, a little bit more willing to go out, I can see a perfect PhD thesis that is a data paper, a reproducibility analysis paper, and a static PDF paper. We can play around the rules. The institution will say, oh, he published three papers, and they're high impact if we can make data papers high impact. And that will actually really slow things down and make the student dig in, create something that's useful for everybody. So I don't advise finishing with zero papers. I think I was pushing it there. But I really feel that there's no need to do 10 different PDFs. There's ways that students can really slow down, focus on the workflow, and finally get credit for it, something that wasn't possible five years ago. And that's a good upper point, so thank you. I'm finishing on a, on a more optimistic note. 